Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. And I'm Julia Martin from the Australian Research Data Commons. And I want to thank you today for joining us for the second in a series of webinars, which will showcase outputs from the ARDC funded RDC and DEVIL projects um, and the benefits and the reuse potential. And today's webinar is going to focus on output supporting or developed during the marine and characterisation projects. The speakers from marine will include Sebastian Mancini, who's the director of IMOS and was the marine project manager. We've got Tim Langwa, um, the senior ecologist from the University of Western Australia and marine project stakeholder. And Ari Friedman, uh, he's a software engineer and project lead and developer. Now, we also have speakers from the Characterisation Data Enhanced Virtual Lab Project. Lance Wilson from Monash University. He's a CVL coordinator who will talk to federating characterisation resources. And Andrew Maynard, the senior lecturer from UWA and project lead who will talk to the micros microscopy characterisation and analysis perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, so apparently I've been promoted. I'm not the director of AODN anymore, I'm a director of IMOS, but no. <laughs> so I'm Sebastian Mancini, I'm the director of the Australian Ocean Data Network. So uh, the, the AODN is a facility of IMOS, is in charge of the data management of all the data collected by the IMOS project. And another mission of the AODN is to uh, create an infrastructure that to publish all marine data into a single framework. So that's the goal of the AODN. Um, so today I'm going to give you a quick overview in 10 minutes about the marine RDC project that we've run last year. Um, and then Tim and Ari will dive into more detail about the tools that have been developed. So the, the thing about the marine RDC project was it, it came out after the um, AODN technical advisory group recommendation uh, a year before to that recommended that we improve the capture and delivery of biological data into the portal. And so we submitted a a proposal to improve biological data delivery and there was multiple subcomponents of a project that you you can see below so focusing you know on bi biological data but not exclusively because we had other data set that we wanted to to take care of like a surface wave observation for example so today i'm not going to go through the the whole seven components tim and ari actually are going to talk about the National Service for Marine Imagery, so both Global Archive and Squiddle. So that's that's perfect. And then I, I think I will spend more time, you know, six or seven minutes really on the the, the linkages that the IODN has been doing and establish, establishing connection with a national repository of um, large organization collecting marine data. Uh, yeah, so overall the project has been developing tools like we will see with Tim and Ari, but also, I guess, highlighting some data set and um, that were already available on the internet, most of them. But for those data set, we've been adding web services on top of it to, um, to improve data accessibility and reusability. So that's really the main outcome of the RDC was to you know, enable web services for some of the data set. So the, of the goal of a subcomponent seven was really to link you know, the AODN portal to some of the data set that were uh, owned by other uh, organizations. So we were focusing on five of them. So the Australian, um, the Australian Institute of Marine Science, the Atlas of Living Australia, CSRO, and Geoscience Australia. And for each of them, we decided with our partners to focus on um, one or two data sets that they have that they wanted to, to share with us. And so 
really the, the, the end goal was to publish uh, data on the AOGN portal. So the AOGN portal is the main window where we, we display uh, the data collected by IMOS but by other partners. So it's sort of in three steps. The first step is about search and discovery. So you look through different data set collection using different facets like parameter, platform or organization. Then on step two, you are able to visualize the different data set collection and overlay them on top of each other, filtering them by different type of filters like spatial subset or temporal extent or parameters sort of subset. And when you decided to pick the area of the data that you want, you can see at the end, step three, the download um, panel where you can select the, the data you want in, in different type of format. So that's really the focus of the AOGN portal in recent years has been about search discovery, but also access to the data, um, really for the user to really download the data at the end of, uh, of the system. And so four years ago, we released the portal and at the beginning, it was only really working for with 100% of IMOS collection in there because we were in control of that, so it was easy to publish. But since then, we've connected different type of um, national repository to the to the portal, and like just recently, really, we've gone to 200, almost 250 dataset collection on the portal, and 50% of them are from IMOS, and 50% are from other organization that you can see on that on that graph. So mostly IMAS, so the University of Tasmania, but but other partners have been adding collection from their repository. And so, what does it mean to actually publish data to the AOGEN portal? It the portal really is a is just the the window to show the data, but it consumes web services. So it relies on uh, metadata standards like the ISO 19.1.1.5 to for the search interface. And so looking at different fields in the metadata to power the facilitate search um, and using controlled vocabularies, which I will talk after. And then the second part is uh, web services and if the portal consume web services to enable the step two and the step three. So the, the map using web map service and then the step three web feature service or any other type of download service that could be uh, made available by other people so that can be consumed. Um, and so what we had to do for that part of a project was really to to look at okay we need to look at the metadata and and ingest that information into the portal but also the web map service and the download service and so for each of those organization these are the tools that those organization are using and as you can see mostly we are using the same combination of tools so geo network for the metadata catalog and geo server for the delivery of web map service and web feature service but there was some you know differences like aad is using gcmd and the diff uh, metadata standard for their metadata or ala is using their own set of web services ga using his own sort of web services for api um, or api for accessing their um, GeoTIFF data. So we had to do some compromise to um, change the portal to actually connect to those different services. And so for the download services, for example, we, we made the connection to GA and CSRO and ALA to use their already existing API where they, they made changes to their API to actually connect to the portal. And that was pretty good. Um, and then for the metadata, yeah, I will talk a bit later after that. So, um, yeah, and and the others like Ames and AAG were a bit simpler because they were already using GeoServer and the same way as delivering data as IMOS. So that was a bit easier to ingest. For the metadata, most of us are using the same standards. So the ISO 19115 and the Marine Community Profile. GA is has already stepped up to the new um new standard dash one and so basically for the metadata one of the key thing was to use um, control vocabularies that is really very important to ingest and power the facilitate search and so what we did there was 
a couple of years ago, we published a lot of our vocabularies on the Research Vocabularies Australia website. And so we use that platform to both, you know, create, edit our vocabularies, and then we publish it. And then we ask um, our partners to actually use it in their metadata catalog to tag their metadata. So we've been using that. And on the RVA platform, you can you can select a range of different uh, published vocabularies that we use um, that are very important to tag our metadata fields. So platform, um, instruments, organization, or discovery parameter, all those ones all those vocabularies are available for people to download and reuse. And so that has been a very important thing for getting the, the data and the metadata into the system. And so the, the end goal is that that's the outcome of a, this part of a project was really to connect to the AOGN all those different repo, you know, repositories. And so we've got the temperature loggers from Ames, which covers 300 temperature data for the last 30 years available there, the ALA and all the marine occurrence data is in the portal. And so and Geoscience Australia, I think it's a great example where they've got bathymetry that they've done for the MH370 um, search um, that's now available as a web map service, but also a download service. So we, we connect to their service. So that was pretty successful. Um, I guess the highlights of a project was more like federated standardized data supply. It's possible, it's technically feasible. It's, uh, if, I think the technology has changed so much lately that it's very, I think it's possible to do it. It's more, it relies on standards. And so you need standards for the metadata, but also the data, but you still need a little bit of fiddling to, to make the connection. And I think now it's not really a technical, technology problem, it's a community commitment. So getting those partners to continue to add more data into the system, it's still, it's still a challenge. Um, yeah, and I've, yeah, so that was a, a great, great outcome. And we're still working with partners to get more data set collection into our portal now. I think I will stop here. Thanks, Seb, that's fantastic. Um, we'll hand over now to Tim. Thanks very much, Julia. Uh, here we go. I... Right, thanks very much, Seb, for introducing um, us. And so I'm going to talk about this global archive, uh, which is a system that I and Ari Friedman from Graybits have been working on for the last five years, really, to help to bring together data set from a particular uh, domain in the marine environment. Um, so I'm going to talk in particular about the global archive tool and also a data sync tool. I'll get to that more in detail in a moment. Um, and this particular marine imagery project, as Seb mentioned, was funded by the Australian Research Data Commons. So the data sets we're going to be talking about are from stereo baited video systems. You can see one being deployed over the side of a boat here um, in Northern Australia. Um, I'm going to show you now just a brief video clip of what a stereo video system looked like. So this is some work we've been conducting with the Marine Biodiversity Hub. Um, characterizing fish and habitats inside some of the new marine parks that exist around Australia. And this is a method, this baited remote underwater video system. It's been adopted broadly um, by marine park managers and scientists around Australia and now internationally, in particular for investigating and studying marine parks. You see the dark green areas there, the no-take areas that we are studying. And you can see here a stereo camera system with two cameras, um, they're calibrated so we can do length measurements afterwards being deployed to the bottom of the Ninglu Reef, and then we see the fishes come in. So what this data essentially generates is information on the biodiversity, species, uh, abundance, and the size distribution of fishes and sharks um, around Australia. So we're currently running projects in particular um, with Australian marine parks, looking at some of the new deeper water uh, reserves created around Australia. So that's the data that we're looking at. Now, the right, so as I mentioned, this data is very useful for characterizing fish and shark assemblages, and it's been adopted um, around Australia internationally. There's one particular software called Event Measure, which is generally used to do these stereo and length estimates. 
Um, <clears throat> but there's also some global initiatives such as the FinPrint program that use mono cameras as well. So in, in a sense, it should be relatively easy to synthesize and bring all these data sets together. However, um, we found that wasn't really the case around Australia internationally. So Australia is currently the leader in, this, in development of this technology, so the baited remote systems and also the diver swum systems. You can see someone there swimming a diver swum stereo video system. Um, that's the distribution of sample points we have currently around Australia um, put into the global archive system. Um, and there's also evolving methods, in particular remote operated vehicles and tow videos that are using these same stereo methods to sample fish and sharks. But what we found we needed was we needed a centralized uh, data archive because we found that actually by surveying different people around the country, there was a lot of differences in the way people were dealing with the data, how they were using quality control. And there's also a real uh, need to be future ready for the future of image um, automation of image annotation. All these annotations are currently done manually, but there's a clear um, need and uh, desire to move this to a more automated annotation system for these fish and sharks so we can speed up um, the data access process. So we decided to devise Global Archive to solve some of these problems for synthesizing the different data sets and ensure that time series data will be available for the future. So essentially what Global Archive, when we designed it, we tried to design it so it would be flexible so that we could import historical annotations that weren't collected. Because um, back in the day when I started this you know, 20 years ago, we were just watching video cameras and writing things down on pieces of paper and then entering it into Excel. So there weren't any proper annotations done. But now we have, the, uh, have more modern stereo annotation software. So we need some way to try and bring together these two different forms of historical and modern annotation data sets. And at the same time, working with the people working internationally, like the FinPrint project, to make sure what we were doing was going to be um, mutable with their work as well. Um, we chose to take an approach <clears throat> of having a custodian for particular projects that were uploaded and then organizing, organizing the, the sampling events as campaigns into, public, into, into projects and then also en enabling the metadata to be all metadata is public and so discoverable in the system with the option for making the complete data set open. Now we took this um, approach of developing this sharing procedure because um, you know, we're trying to move the marine ecological community towards an open data um, approach, but sometimes it's a bit tricky and sometimes they're somewhat, um, you know, not always forward of sharing data and making data sets open. However, by creating this system, we've enabled people to build trust in the idea of sharing and collaborating and making data sets open. Um, so, for example, this, this model doesn't really follow, follow an AODN sort of best use model in the sense that not all the actual annotation data sets are open, but all the, pub, all the metadata is public. So everyone can see and discover data and request custodians to share the data sets with them. Uh, <clears throat> and so currently we've uh, reached out to custodians around Australia and shared 22,000 stereo grub deployments into a synthesis of data sets around Australia. And this is helping us to build trust and build the idea of, of making these data sets more open and available to everybody. Um, just briefly, I'm going to outline and try and illustrate how Global Archive has changed the acquisition of this data. So the old situation used to be we go in the field, collect this wonderful video footage and analyze it with event measure. And then from that, query some summaries of the data and then use Excel to make some plots and make some, make some uh, reports and maybe put it in a database. And it might have had some form of metadata associated with it. Um, might have used R, maybe. But this led to a really unfortunate fog of error where we really weren't sure about the QAQC and the data and we couldn't ever go back to the original annotations. So the whole objective of Global Archive has been to try and close this loop and also remove this problem of this, these, these important data essentially sitting on people's hard drives on their desk around the country and not being backed up adequately. So the new, new workflow we now have with Global Archive and Sync Tool that Ari will introduce in a minute. We use Sync Tool to back up the imagery to a national repository. And we have this working, we've been carried out some pilot, pilot workshops with people around Australia, and this works really nicely. We use that to also create a metadata standard. Push this into Global Archive, the raw annotations from event measure. So we're maintaining a link to 
the raw annotations as closely as possible, and then have queries coming out from Global Archive and into a data analysis framework. And currently we have our QAQC sits in R and, and then feeds back, it gives us a list of things we need to go and check in the event measure annotations and then feed that back through Sync Tool into Global Archive. But in the future, we're hoping to move this QAQC very much into the sort of Sync Tool Global Archive step so that we don't have to keep doing this loop. Um, but this, at the moment, this is a good feedback loop that works quite well to QAQC the data sets and then produce reporting. So we've removed the fog of error we previously had. We've now working with um, partners around Australia internationally to see how this best fits into everyone's workflows. And so <clears throat> this is my first example of reuse and sort of the motivations for it. Um, we've uh, just put in an application to the Transformative Data Collections um, uh, grants with ARDC to run some national workshops and create some global archive champions. Uh, following the model uh, used by EcoCloud, the ARDC project. We've got all state marine conservation agencies, conservation agencies and fisheries management agencies that are using the Stereo Brub technology. They want to adopt the global archive workflows we've developed. Um, and the reason for that is because they see that it allows them to sort of meet best practice standards, also allows them to save time. I had a great quote from a researcher in New South Wales recently who said, you know, we were running a workshop with him. He said, this obviously took you a long time to, to develop and it's going to save us a lot of time um, in work and effort. Um, and also people, are, people want to use to move towards this workflow because they can use the sync tool to back up their imagery to the National Archive and give them another backup for this important imagery um, around the country. Internationally, uh, the Global Finprint Project, which has been funded by the Vulcan Foundation through uh, Paul Allen Philanthropies, um, they're a national, an international project that's collected 18,000 samples around the world of fish and sharks using similar methods. And they want somewhere to host their data that's going to be open and also enable a synthesis with other data sets. So they want to start, they want to upload the data onto Global Archive and maintain the annotations um, in the truest form as possible. And another example closer to home, I'm actually a, an across domains. I'm currently the coordinator of the Masters in Ecology at UWA um, and we're developing a new big data unit where we're going to be using AID services such as EcoCloud, uh, linking to ALA and using BCTVL as well for doing biodiversity modelling and uh, species distribution modelling. And the students have really um, taken to this and as part of this new big data unit we're actually proposing um, because in marine ecology and in, in, in our ecology discipline in general, most of the master students that produce a thesis and are trying to submit it to a journal. At the moment, these journals aren't really requiring any evidence of a reproducible data analysis workflow. But what we're going to propose to do in this master's in this new big data unit as part of the master's thesis is that the students will actually learn to create, for example, a GitHub repository that has all the code that produces their data analyses for their theses. And then because Global Archive was built in a really flexible way that allowed us to actually ingest historical data sets that had a variety of different formats, we are proposing to use Global Archive at UWA um, to actually um, hold and archive all the data sets the students produce, which could come from a range of different methods and sampling approaches. Um, but we, because of the flexibility of Global Archive, we'll be able to host the data sets on it and then link to their GitHub repositories and create um, truly reproducible research, which I think is going to be a good skill for these students to leave UWA with. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. That's everything I had to present on that. Any questions? Right, we'll keep questions to the end, Tim, and it's oh, now over cool. to Ari. Hi. Thanks. Um, so, Tim, I had actually thought that you were going to be talking about um, uh, sync tool. Oh, so I don't actually have any sync tool slides in here, although I do have something in the back that if, at the end that ties it all together. So, anyway, um, uh, we can. So, so I'm t I'm going to talk about uh, another online platform um, called Squiddle Plus. Um, it's uh, built on the same underlying architecture as uh, Global Archive, um, so it's very similar in many ways, um, but it's 
targeted towards an end-to-end -end, uh, suite of tools for data analysis. Um, and so it was built with funding support largely from the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Um, and uh, also now IMOS is going to be funding uh, some further development of the, of the tools. Um, and it's designed for the exploration, management, and annotation of images and video data. Um, it's also built to uh, integrate with machine learning tools. And so the system's designed to be platform agnostic, meaning that um, in the case of Global Archive, we're focusing primarily on Bruvs, which is uh, the image in the top right. But um, Squiddle Plus is, uh, is intended to be able to support different data types uh, and different data formats coming from a variety of different platforms. Um, and the, the, the idea is that it ingests all this data through a flexible uh, data ingestion API, um, which supports multiple different data types. And it speaks heavily to the idea, um, both of these platforms, Global Archive and Squiddle, speak heavily to the idea of data reuse. Um, the examples in this, this slide here are all marine-based, but there's nothing specifically marine about the um, Squiddle Plus um, platform. Um, in theory, it could be extended to other, to other data, data sources as well. So one example of a data source, just to give you an overview of the system briefly, um, is shown here. This map gives you an idea of regular repeat surveys that have been collected by the integrated marine observing systems AUV node. Um, most of these surveys are done every year as part of the integrated marine observing system, and there's a huge volume of spatially and temporally diverse data set with repeat monitoring. Um, the biggest issue faced here is not is is that the um, rates of data collection are outpacing the rates of possible data analysis, and so um, there's over five million images in the AODN repository, which um, Seb had highlighted earlier, um, and all of these five million IMOS AUV images have been imported into Squiddle Plus. So. The data here is all uh, discoverable through the platform and ready for further analysis within the platform using the tools that are all online. And so while the AODN, AODN is hosting the data, Squiddle Plus is making an alternative uh, portal to access the data hosted on the AODN um, and also providing tools to do analysis so uh, that the data doesn't have to all then be downloaded and analyzed uh, offline where everybody's using their own sort of analysis workflow and then um, try to reconcile that afterwards makes it very difficult for data reuse. Um, and so Squiddle Plus has currently got uh, far over 5 million stereo image pairs um, from 683 um, IMOS AUV deployments uh, across 49 campaigns and um, every single one of the images that get uploaded or media items that are uploaded has associated metadata. So it, here you can see uh, the images with associated latitude, longitude, depth, and a number of additional sensor data. Um, and in addition to the, the data that's ingested, it also uh, has various layers integrated into the user interface from external services. So again, as Seb mentioned, uh, pulling in uh, external data sources to provide sort of context uh, the way that the AADN is doing it where they're, they're um, integrating with these external data sources. Um, Squiddle is doing something similar and Global Archive does the same where these map layers provide contextual awareness for the data contained in the system. Um, and rather than trying to reinvent the wheel here, we're just sucking in data from these external data sources providing a richer experience for the users. So for example here is here the deployments on the map uh, underlaid by satellite imagery from ESRI. We've got a map layer here from Geoscience Australia showing bathymetry, ecological features um, from the Department of Environment and Energy, geomorphic features from Geoscience Australia. Um, and so in addition to these layers, we can uh, zoom in and look at the individual deployments contained within the system, and we can query those deployments for further analysis. So um, this, the Squiddle Plus, interface provides a tool for quickly searching through campaigns or filtering the data by depth and altitude, 
um, and uh, we can then go into further analysis of the data. So here's an example of how data might be analyzed within the system. You've got annotation tools to um, uh, where you can select a variety of different methods for annotation um, points or a grid of points or randomly distributed points. Um, and you can also then search through uh, multiple different annotation schemes and labels can be applied. Um, you can apply multiple labels per point um, and there's lots of sort of configurations in the view like adjusting contrast and brightness. And um, One of the main sort of core features of uh, the system which is really important when, it, when we're talking about data reuse and uh, discoverability and collaboration and synthesis is the problem of standardization. And so um, Global Archive does a really good job at uh, capturing BRUV's data um, where the annotation schemes that are used are relatively consistent because uh, we're talking mostly about fish data. But in a lot of situations, particularly for benthic ecology, the annotation schemes that get used, um, the sort of vocabularies are very different. And so looking at this image of what I would call seaweed, um, in, depending on what annotation scheme you use, it might be called any one of these different things that are, that are on the screen. So kelp seaweed, macroalgae, clonia radiata, canopy forming macroalgae. And so um, one of the things that, that Squiddle tries to address is this idea of standardization. And so um, what's been tried in the past and has failed several times before is to sort of say, well, we'll just introduce uh, an annotation scheme and everyone will have to use it. Um, and this cartoon highlights that quite well. So um, if you've got a number of competing standards and you want to make one gold standard to rule them all, what you end up with is yet another competing standard. And that tends to happen. So the way that we deal with this with, from within the Squiddle framework or the Marine DB framework to be more specific, because Global Archive is part of the same, same sort of framework, is to provide multiple annotation schemes and to then link um, the different to be able to map between the schemes so so wherever possible and it's not always a one-to-one -one mapping but wherever possible is two different annotation schemes and we can link these these uh different data sets that have been analyzed using different annotation schemes by mapping the classification schemes to each other um, and then this provides in tools for e exporting the data um, in consistent views and formats that can then go on to um, uh, you can then reuse for sort of other purposes. So just to provide a bit of an overview of how things hang together, um, the typically if you if you have a, an existing um, data collection program, the data gets uploaded to online cloud storage facility, as in the case with the IMOS AUV. That data then gets automatically synced to um, Marine DB or Squiddle, um, and Squiddle can then support multiple online uh, repositories. So it's not just limited to being able to 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 suck in data from a, one particular repository, but it can sort of interface with multiple repositories. Um, and then it provides tools for analysis, online analysis, um, and data export and tools for collaboration, so a lot of these tools are still in development, uh, sort of data sharing tools. And uh, there's also the idea that you can provide multiple inter user interfaces for the same backend. So MarineDB is the sort of underlying infrastructure, Squiddle is sort of a science user front end, but we can also provide multiple simplified user interfaces for interfacing for, for citizen science projects or other types of uh, you know, different, different, different types of users that might be interested in viewing the data in different ways. And so um, Global Archive is a separate front end to different components of uh, the MarineDB system. And Global Archive is, is based on an old version of MarineDB. So uh, work in the future is going to be uh, sort of building these two, these two interfaces onto the same sort of common backend. And then the other thing that uh, Squiddle Plus and MarineDB support is machine learning uh, integration. And so uh, the machine learning sort of provides uh, the promise of, of being able to then uh, 
solve the problem of, of, of this uh, data collection outpacing the data analysis. So, so it, will, it will assist in being able to process much more data much more quickly. Um, and we need the sort of user interface to, to sort of connect these algorithms to the end users. And so one of the things that is a core requirement is that we don't want to be um, beholden to a single, uh, a single automated algorithm like um, some, of the, some of the existing systems provide. Um, the idea is that we're providing a platform that, that facilitates integration with multiple online algorithms, multiple uh, automated algorithms. And so here's an example of some classified results where this was from my PhD thesis, which is already sort of a very old way of doing image classification. Um, but you can see you've gone from a few points, point labels on images through to sort of every pixel in every, in every image being possible, being, being classified. Um, and then uh, integrating these algorithms into Squiddle Plus will provide, or into MarineDB and, and with, the, with the, the user interface of Squiddle Plus provides users with magical suggestions to sort of speed up the analysis. So what their job becomes is more, instead of one of just uh, having to label everything and search for a classification scheme, it becomes more validating the automated classifier to make sure that the results um, that are being provided by the classifier are sensible. And once users are happy with the results, they can then use the automated results to continue analysis. And so putting this all together in a very sort of complicated diagram here, um, this, uh, it shows, it shows um, the different components of the marine DB system. Um, and so both, as I've mentioned, both Global Archive and Squiddle Plus are built on MarineDB. The underlying framework and code base are all open source, um, but it should be pointed out that the benefit of this of these systems is really to have the centralization of data. So it, while it's possible for everyone to spin up their own instances, it doesn't really make that much sense because we really want to centralize the, 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 the data. Um, and, uh, but with that said, there are various libraries that provide um, that provide access to the data stored within the APIs. And these are also open source, which um, mean that it, for people who want to work with external tools, or you might have, or you might have some uh, uh, scripts that do your data analysis and you want to be able to suck data in dynamically from these different APIs, uh, accord that, that these, these libraries will um, facilitate data uh, facilitate interaction with the with the API to pull the data into your into your program and, and obviously subject to the sharing constraints that are built into the system. Um, and so another thing that's interesting about this diagram here is you can see that machine learning um, users are effectively machine learning algorithms are effectively special users of the system. So they're subject to the same sort of uh, sharing constraints as the rest of the users, but the um, they interact directly with the um, API and so there are libraries which are still in development for facilitating this and so in a sense these tools are providing cross-disciplinary collaboration and sharing of data and also synergies between sort of the marine science community and also um, the sort of machine learning researchers with the ultimate um, goal of providing various data outputs like discoverable data, high level stats and summaries, facilitating collaboration, um, science communication, academic publication, ultimately leading to informed policy. So looking at that same diagram a slightly different way, this is more a workflow. Um, one of the things to point out here um, by facilitating online analysis tools is in in the workflow here there, where you're using external annotations, uh, there's still a number of steps required here. Uh, the, the red arrows flag the manual processes involved, whereas the green arrows show the automated steps and um, sharing is shown by the blue arrows. So if you can see here, there's a number of red arrows if you're taking the route external annotations outside of the system. So for example, in the Bruvs community, event measure is used because uh, it's necessary because we're doing sort of stereo uh, video annotation um, where there aren't existing online viewers for online annotation tools for this yet. Um, it's necessary to do this an 
analysis uh, external to the, the platform. But the caveat there is that there are several manual steps involved in um, then putting this data online. So um, you can see the data custodians are charged with unstructured data that then um, is quite difficult to, to put into a structured format that will be consistent for online repositories. Um, that and the annotations as well, when you're, when you're not dealing with consistent annotation schemes, becomes very difficult too. So we've developed the sync tool, um, which is aimed towards simplifying a lot of that process. So what happens is unstructured data goes in, the sync tool will verify the, uh, it, it, it's an application that runs on your local machine. Um, you will import your imagery that you used in your analysis and import the, um, or at least point it to the imagery and point it to the metadata files. And it will reconcile and make sure that uh, the, the imagery matches up with the metadata files. And it will do some validation checks on the metadata files to make sure that everything checks out prior to syncing it to one of the online platforms. Um, and so even with, with Global Archive, uh, you export data from event measure, but there's still a step of making a metadata file which tells Global Archive um, more information about the georeferencing information of your deployments and a number of the things that aren't captured through event measure that you need to put into Global Archive. And it also captures a lot of the metadata. So the sync tool aims is sort of aimed towards streamlining the data wrangling efforts that need to happen by manually reconciling annotations and manually reconciling uh, the survey data. Um, the annotations, reconciling the annotations is something that's that's still part of future work for the sync tool. Um, but up till now, as part of the Marine IDC, it's more about pushing data to an, uh, an established online repository. And so um, Sync Tool currently does that. Um, we're still working on a Windows build for it. Um, but just to give you a sort of comparison here, if you don't, if you do, if you use the online annotation tools, it cuts out a large number of the manual processes. And so there's a manual process here, which is involved uploading structured data to a data repository. And if if you if you have structured data, like as in the case where you always have consistent metadata coming out of your uh, data sources, like for the case of AUVs, um, the data can go into a data repository and everything is sort of streamlined and automated and the manual step is um, the manual annotation and analysis of the data, but there's no additional sort of data wrangling needed to, to make the data discoverable um, and to do the analysis. Um, and then eventually when you start plugging in machine learning tools, uh, it becomes more an effort of validation, um, provided the, the, what you're trying to do can be solved by machine learning tools. And so looking at some of the to-dos that are still left here, um, the Global Archive um, has a lot of data sharing tools built in, as, as Tim mentioned. Um, and we're planning to roll Global Archive into MarineDB and into Squiddle into, uh, to have it as a separate interface for, for the system. Um, so some of the data sharing components need to be built into the new version of MarineDB. The annotation scheme management um, need to be built into the user interface. Uh, and we're uh, building, building in sort of curated species catalogs to assist with the annotation expanding the machine learning functionality. So there's actually a LEAF grant that's uh, been submitted to sort of build in, build, build out some of the machine learning tools um, behind this, this platform and to integrate various other machine learning tools to provide interfaces for machine learning researchers to contribute algorithms. Um, photo mosaics. So um, one of the, one of the facts, factors of the system is that one of the sort of features of the system is that it, it is um, annotation, a bit sorry, it's media type agnostic. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about an image or a video or a large scale mosaic or a map. Um, it provides the same, um, it provides uh, annotation tools in the same annotation framework for a variety of different media types. You just have to build an online viewer for it. So um, that's really the limiting factor is building the online viewer. So if we have streamable video, we can annotate in the stream, streamable video. If we have a a web service that provides frame shots of video, we can interface with that web service and Squiddle can then provide an annotation tool for that. Um, 
provides citizen science interfaces, which are possible to be developed on the same backend, um, provides reporting and high-level overviews. These are some things that, that still need further development. QAQC tools, while there are some basic QAQC tools, um, we plan to extend that further. Um, and then the idea of expanding these platforms for um, additional application domains. So uh, the examples here are from marine imagery, but we could be um, showing the so you know, we could be using the same platform for UAV imagery. Um, and then uh, also one other sort of looming thing is uh, work out long-term support and funding arrangements for sustainability. So one of the bottlenecks up till now has been user support, supporting the, the um, you know, giving the users uh, data steward stewardship to help get data into the system, supporting users using the system, uh, training users, um, also uh, just responding to, to user requests. Um, it really has been a, a bottleneck in terms of not having enough development support with this platform. Hopefully that's going to be changing soon. Um, there is an IMOS uh, proposal under consideration for uh, expanding the development team, but there is still plenty of plenty more scope for investment in these in these types of projects. So um, I think that's what I will leave you guys with, and I think I've probably gone a little bit over time, but that's fantastic, Ari. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go straight across to characterization, and our next presenter is Lance Wilson. All right, excellent. Thank you for inviting me along. So. What I want to talk to you today is, and I'm probably going to uh, get the two terms convoluted together, is the characterization virtual laboratory and the sea devil. So the sea devil is is our data enhanced version of the CVL, um, and practically we we usually use the CVL as the short name for everything that we do. So just to give you a little bit of background of what the CVL is. So what we what we want to do for researchers is put all of their tools and their data in the one place. So that one place can be anywhere around the country, but what we're trying to do is ensure that any uh, data that a researcher collects at an instrument around the country hits a system where the tools are there so that they can actually carry out the research. So that's what we try and do for the researcher. In terms of the project, what we the, the project view of the CVL is it's a program of work where we have identified areas inside the characterization space where where we can where we can make a difference, where things that we can develop or coordinate can help them to, to carry out their research um, quicker. So today I want to talk about two two main things. One is the reusable components that we've built as part of the, the CVL project. And the second thing I want to talk about is, is uh, our journey in terms of federation. So what we've been doing at the moment is we, we began with one site and now we're up to three sites. And what I want to do is talk about how, how we've gone along that. So if we look at the reusable software and infrastructure, I want to talk through these in a little bit more detail as we go along. So the the things that we provide in terms of the CVL primarily from the the user point of view is a remote desktop environment so the and the way that we do that is using a tool called strudel and strudel web um, both of those uh, software programs are bundled together and there's, there's a couple of services underneath which i'll talk through in a second uh, the next thing that we have that is useful for people who don't have a repository technology in this space is MyTardis. So MyTardis is our general purpose repository which we use for connecting all of the instruments and characterization which span from things like the Australian synchrotron all the way down to sort of desktop um, microscopes. The next thing that we've developed is an authorization service using, uh, using SSH certificates and the AAF. So what we try and do for researchers is that they come in with a single identity and then we use that identity to map across to all of the different underlying services that we provide. Um, the next thing that we have built as part of this project is, is automation scripts for rebuilding all of our infrastructure. So everything that we bring up, 
any databases, login nodes, um, I'm trying to think of anything else that we do. All of it is is built using um, Ansible scripts so that in the event that a, a cloud node disappears, we can easily rebuild it. Um, probably another really important one which is useful for many people is we've built some data repatriation scripts that are used to pull data back from the, from ansto and specifically this trans synchrotron what those scripts are really useful for is if you have an api um, on the other end these scripts are made to interact with apis that we that are provided from research institutions and this allows you to pull the data in a in a in a sane way um, the last thing that we that uh, is probably inherently reusable from this is we've been working very hard at containerizing every piece of software that we install on the in the characterization virtual laboratory. This has been an ongoing process. So in the past we didn't do this um, because we were running in a different way. But now that, that we're we've moved on, so that this this makes sense for us. So on this slide here, you can see there's a, a nice pretty picture of our desktop. Um, you can see this is so that researchers, when they come in, they get a they get an environment that looks reasonably uh, comfortable, that they, they can recognize what they need to do here. Um, and on, on that, you can see the, the top level menus are organized by uh, community. So we support a whole range of communities on there, um, neutron beam imaging, general light microscopy, cryo-electron microscopy is a really strong focus for us at the moment. The, in the background, you can see that there's a web interface and that's the web interface that you get to prior to, to hitting the desktop, which I'll just talk through a little bit. So when I was talking about the authorization service and Strudel web, what those parts look like is this. So a user comes in and they see a web page where they get a choice to choose a remote system. So in this case here, you can see we've got CVL at UWA. Um, we have a specifically branded uh, CVL for um, the design house people. Um, they use that, they click the whichever one they want to log into, that then redirects to the AAF. That redirection then uses the AAF to create some a certificate that gets passed around to all of the infrastructure parts. So from a user point of view, they don't need to see that they're, they're authorized themselves around all the different parts. Once they've logged in, then they, they get presented with a, with a choice about what type of desktop they want to run and where they want those resources to come up and, and who they want to charge those resources to. So in this case here, the, the, they progress through to the job control stage, which has taken all of their authorization, and that authorization is then you can fire up a job on our HPC systems. And they, that job is then either a VNC desktop or a guacamole desktop, and that depends on, on whether they want to use the desktop client or the web version. So just to give some context about where Strudel is deployed, so we're, we are now, <laughs> we've been international for a little while and we're getting significantly more uptake around the country. So pretty much we've hit everywhere except for Northern Territory, I think, and I think we're still struggling a bit with, with New South Wales, but we're still running quite a number of deployments around the country. And they vary from where, where we're highly engaged with them or to, all the way to they've just taken the source code and they're, they're running it themselves. Just to give you some perspective on how 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 well used it is, we we've been providing this this particular version of the desktop since 2016, um, with a, a number of incremental improvements along the way. So currently we're up to 40,000 desktops, and we're typically getting over 200 unique users a month on the system. All right, if we move on from the Strudel and Strudel Web to the MyTardis, so where we, where we help researchers with their data is at the instrument, and MyTardis is how we do that. So the MyTardis project itself has a, has a couple of parts to it. The first part that I want to talk through is the MyData client, which you put onto the microscope or whatever the instrument is, and that, that then is used to replicate that data into the MyTardis um, 
ecosystem. So my TARDIS is a couple of things. It's a web interface to uh, some research storage and also to the metadata. So what we've done, if you want to have a look at, is we have a store.monash, which is where uh, I think can't remember we're up to about 60 instruments or more. Probably going to get corrected in a minute about how many that is. We pretty much every instrument on on Monash's campus is integrated now. Um, and when new instruments come along, this is this is the tool that we use to to pull the data in. It's really useful for researchers too, from the point of view that there's a a feature inside it which allows data to be pushed to uh, analysis systems. So currently this pushes to um, the CVL, it also pushes to uh, Massive as well. Uh, right. All right, so if we move on to the Federation activities that we've been carrying out this for the past 18 months, what I want to cover is is how we how we got to the point of where we are. So and to begin with, with that, we want to talk through a little bit about the architecture that we, we got there from. So the CVL, in terms of the desktop, which, we, which we're which we running up in multiple nodes around the country, started off as the original CVL project, which was on Nectar. That project then led to a HPC on cloud uh, project called Monarch. Uh, that that particular cluster is, is ongoing, and then that's the, the campus cluster for all, all Monash researchers. From there, every time that we, we've moved, we've We've learned new things and, and redeveloped a technology to, to be current. Um, that led to the massive M3 system and us putting CVL on top of that massive system. And finally, that's led to the current C-Devil activities, which is CVL at UWA and CVL at UQ. So I'm probably not going to talk through this in any great depth. We, we're running two different models of CVL around the country. One is our source model, which is where you deploy on a cloud um, using our Ansible scripts, which then brings up all of the infrastructure that you need. The secondary model that we're running is where you deploy CVL on top of an existing HPC system. Um, each of them have, has their own in, inherent design choices inside that. And this is why, as part of Federation, we needed to explore both because if you can get access to large uh, nationally funded resources to put CVL on top of, that really makes sense. So the architecture that we went with is, is how we've been running projects inside the characterization community with where we have really strong governance where that governance is made up of the research community and the infrastructure providers. And that, that mean, means that the things that we build are really researcher focused. Um, that then leads down into the lead node. And in this case, I'm, I am the lead node. And where we do here is we're, we're really trying to make sure that the things that we learn from our very large user community here gets deployed around the, the rest of the nodes around the country. Um, the other thing that we really want to have as part of the Federation is that any node that has a specialized capability, they, that that can be contributed back into the, into the national experience. And this is what this architecture has allowed us to, to really strongly partner with the research community and the infrastructure providers. So if we look at this in a little bit more detail, what we're trying to do is is provide a consistent user experience for the for the researchers. So that means that wherever they they come in to the CVL, um, it looks familiar to them. What we what we're really trying to aim for is is a unified experience. But um, because we're running in multiple locations, that that's not necessarily as easy as one might hope. Um, the primary thing I want you to notice with a detailed view is that everything that we do is based around uh, a single identity for the researcher. I'll just move on from there. So if we if we dive into the the technical components of this a little bit more, what we've done for the what we call a CVL in a box, where we you can be provided with all the source, is that all of those parts then the job scheduler, which which runs the desktops for people the identity servers, which translates their IAF identity into, into a local identity, they're, they're all scripted. 
right? So if you wanted to become a CVL partner, you can take those scripts, rebuild a cluster and be up and running in, I don't know, less than a week. The other, the other model that we were running, and you can see on the, on the right-hand side of the slide, is, is <coughs> leveraging an existing HPC cluster. Now, the, the things that are different with those is we, we don't have any control over the, the underlying um, identity services or the job scheduler, but the, the partner node has a capability of setting them up so that we can do we can provide that consistent user experience to everybody. All right, so if we move on to some of the example federation principles that we've been working through. So why we think this, why we're communicating this is we think this is really important when you want to run a system in more than one location. Because as a researcher, you, you want to minimize the amount of time that you spend learning another system to, to get your research done. So what what we've done, at least from the beginning, is we've had a single user portal. So everybody comes in to cvl.org.au and from there everything is linked, uh, whether they, they're going to Strudel Web, which comes from there, or any documentation. That's where our, our intention is, is so that there's one port of call for all that. Uh, the next part, which we, we've... <laughs> We keep learning about is we want to have a single sign-on uh, mechanism and um, we've we've begun with this and it works really well for for a couple of our sites and we're still working through what this looks like when you run with the with the secondary model this means that users can get resources where they need them so if they come in from the one place and then then they get all of their uh, everything they need in the one spot the other the other component probably that we want to talk through a little bit is the the um, single software stack. This is probably the biggest challenge for researchers in this space is how how do they how do they get their tools where their data is? And we've been working really hard on that. So just to talk through that a little bit more, um, the way that we've gone about doing this is is twofold. One is if for the clusters that are running in the CVL in a box mode, it's really simple. You can replicate in my entire software stack and it pretty much just runs out of the box. Um, that That's really fantastic to get up and going. The, the slight tricky part with that is then you, how do you get support for new packages and things? And we're still working on what that looks like. The secondary thing that we've been doing is for all of the software components that we identify now and the work benches that we want to work on, we're, we're making containers for them. So we have a public repository where those container build scripts are located and the containers are also built publicly so people can pull them down and run them wherever they want. Um, this work is really useful. We've, if, if, <laughs> if nothing else, the, the, the reuse of these containers is, and the technology that we use for them is important across all of the research communities. If you can package up your software in a repeatable way and then people can use it, that's, that's really, really good. Okay, so if we move on to the, the last bit, I suppose what I wanted to convey is that the two really strong outcomes from this, the CVL project over the, the last five or six years is we've been trying to build reusable components that people can use for deploying remote desktops anywhere. The, we've also um, developed a repository system which is pretty much you can plug in whatever data you want to it. Uh, the, the, third, the third thing is the authorization service. We're, we strongly encourage the use of this type of authentication because of the, the certificates that can get passed around. This allows systems to have um, passwordless logins for everybody um, in that they, they take their AAF identity. The, the next thing that we'd be really happy to have um, people contribute to our software containers in, the, the last thing too is we'd be really happy to talk to anybody about our federation experience. Um, we've been trying to document how we've gone about that, how we have strong governance, how we've 
how we have the multiple nodes and how we have contributions from those nodes. We're really keen to talk to people about that. Um, a lot of those materials are up in our, in our GitHub under the characterization virtual laboratory. There is also a little, we're, we're beginning it, that's where we're putting our training materials. So that probably covers it from me. Thank you very much, Lance. That was fat, fascinating. Um, and I will now pass over to Andrew. Okay, so I'm going to continue on to talk about the Sea Devil project, uh, but I'm going to talk from one of the partners' perspectives, the Centre for Microscopy, Characterisation and Analysis at the University of Western Australia. My name is Andrew Maynard. I'm a joint Microscopy Australia and National Imaging Facility Informatics Fellow. Uh, the National Imaging Facility and Microscopy Australia both uh, increase uh, characterisation uh, capabilities. Also Senior Lecturer and Group Leader for Data Management, Analysis and Visualisation at the Centre for Microscopy Characterisation and Analysis. Okay, out on my talk, I'll, I'll talk briefly about what the CMCA is. I'll talk about our big data challenge. I'll talk about our path uh, to adopting the MyTARDIS platform. And then I'll talk about how that's linked into our current involvement with the Characterisation Data Enhanced Virtual Laboratory Project. So, about the CMCA, we're a university centre, we collaborate in microscopy uh, and characterisation uh, research, supporting research excellence locally, nationally and internationally. We have some 48 different instrument platforms worth about $45 million Australian, we have around about 35 staff, more than 400 users, and our instruments uh, enable us to characterise uh, the continuum from atoms through to small animals. That's instrumentation, everything from optical and focal micro, uh, microscopes, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, micro CT, and so on. Partners uh, in the centre include the Australian Nanofabrication Facility, Oscope, Metabolomics Australia, and uh, all those others I show on the right hand side there of the slide. Uh, importantly, we are the West Australian node for Microscopy Australia and also the West Australian node for the National Imaging Facility. And together, those organisations are in partnership with Euro Bioimaging through the Global Bioimaging Project. Okay, solving the CMCA Big Data Challenge. Uh, we have a concept of the user pathway in the CMCA. We have a researcher uh, who will come to us with a, a specimen material sample that they want to understand, to characterise. They will talk with uh, academic staff to figure out what would be the appropriate instruments to use to characterise, understand their sample. Uh, so that's the planning aspect of, of uh, the engagement. Uh, if they haven't registered with us already, they need to register. They will get training to use the particular instrument or instruments that they need. And then they go away, book the instrument, collect their data, uh, perform analysis, often using proprietary software on uh, workstations within the centre and with the input from CMCA staff and then hopefully on to uh, results to get publications. What we're finding is that researchers acquiring uh, ever larger amounts of multidimensional data and they're typically using more than just one instrument. So the question is how can we manage, curate and archive this data? So for us at the moment that's about 50 terabytes of data per annum, uh, but that will sharply increase into the next year as we take on uh, cryo electron microscopy capability and also move into human MRI. The data is also long tail data predominantly, that's uh, relatively small, unstructured and uncurated data, so in the tens and hundreds of thousands of files. And how do we uh, adhere to the fair data principles and making that data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable? Then how do we analyse this data to facilitate new discovery? So that deals with everything from uh, computation, data processing and visualisation, and finally, how do we collaborate across multiple sites nationally and internationally? So solving this, cha uh, this uh, challenge is the CMCA informatics strategy, which has three uh, major objectives. The first is to leverage national e-research infrastructure and tools. And of course, here we look to the ARDC and uh, uh, its, its precursors, uh, ANS, Nectar and RDS. Uh, we also look to RNET and given we're in Western Australia, to the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre, and of course to our colleagues at Monash and at, Mon uh, and at Massey. And we make use, of course, of the Australian Access Federation for 
authenticating with online services just using uh, institutional credentials. The second objective has been to harvest instrument data into a data repository service and we've, uh, we use MyTardis for that. I'll comment more on that shortly. And the third objective is to provide users with the ability to analyse and visualise their data in virtual laboratories hosted in the cloud. And of course, this means in our case, the CBO, the Characterisation Virtual Lab. So this is the digital ecosystem uh, that's evolved uh, uh, as, we, as we partner in the Sea Devil project. On the far left, on an instrument, we have a My Data client, uh, uploader client, uh, installed on the instrumental partner PC. A user will acquire their data, they will drag their uh, resulting files to a folder that uh, has a project ID as a name, uh, it's their own project ID. That gets ingested into our repository service uh, in the cloud, uh, in our case, TrueDAP at UWA, which is based on MyTardis. Uh, and this is hosted at uh, Pawsey Supercomputing Centre. CVL at UWA uh, is also hosted at Pawsey, so we make use of that too. And we also make use of CVL at Massive, and as the Federation grows, we'll have more uh, characterisation virtual lab instances we can make use of. Top right, you can see uh, the web portal uh, for the True Data at UWA data store. The user can download their data to their own PC or to one of our high-end workstations in the centre. Or, as Lance mentioned earlier, it's possible to push it onto uh, one of the CVL desktops. So the bottom, the uh, bottom middle, you can see an example of the CVL desktop. Uh, in this case, running through Strudel Web. And of course, since the data is sitting in the cloud uh, at Pawsey or at Massive, we then uh, have a stepping stone into high-performance compute if needed. Okay, the path to my TARDIS. Uh, given we have such a variety of instrument platforms, we we looked around the uh, and all the various offerings we could find in this space. Uh, I've listed a few of those there on the slide. Uh, we eventually ended up uh, adopting MyTardis because it's really been designed for the long tail of instruments. It really is not uh, domain specific. It'll ingest data from anything and it's possible to have uh, post ingest filters to handle uh, metadata depending on the source of, uh, of the data. Uh, so that's why we ended up adopting uh, the MyTardis platform. Plus, uh, it originated at Monash, there's a strong user community in Australia, uh, and we wanted to support that also. So our initial deployment of MyTardis uh, came about uh, with our involvement in the RDS A1.4 transition project. So uh, one of the RDS is now part of ARDC, of course. Uh, we deployed on UWA infrastructure that was provided uh, uh, with a service level agreement through VOCUS, so that's virtual machines and, and storage. And at that time we integrated three uh, electron microscope instruments with the platform and that uh, project ended June 2017. Our current deployment of uh, MyTARDIS is uh, much more mature and it's uh, evolved uh, or, or eventuated from the ARDC funded uh, trusted Data Repositories, uh, National Imaging Facility Trusted Data Repositories project. The aim of that project was to deliver durable, reliable, high quality image data for the National Imaging Facility. Uh, at UWA, we deployed uh, TARDIS then on the Pawsey Nimbus cloud, uh, replacing uh, their Nectar cloud offering. And uh, this involved four nodes of the National Imaging Facility, uh, which I've listed on the slide there, with uh, UWA as the lead node. So to summarise that project in a nutshell, and I won't go into a great amount of detail here, I'll just say the top left again, we're talking about an instrument PC with a piece of software on it, the My Data Client, the Uploader Client. We developed uh, a protocol and agreed process in the National Imaging Facility for uploading data to the repository service, which included specification of uh, uh, minimal metadata, for instance, but also a specification of a standard operating procedure for quality control of the instrument and the fact that we should upload quality control data from the instrument also to the repository. We also require that every instrument integrated with the repository should have a uh, description or record parked in Research Data Australia, uh, a data and uh, service discovery portal uh, provided by the ARDC. Now, that means essentially every instrument has a unique handle or a persistent ID. If you look on the right hand side, uh, the four repository services, uh, we organise data by project ID. Uh, we are moving towards uh, uh, making use of the research activity identifier national database uh, 
instead of uh, locally minted project IDs. Logins via the Australian Access Federation to any of the repositories. Uh, and then the other thing to note there is we have a link to the instrument record located in Research State of Australia. Okay, moving on. The deployment of MyTARDIS at UWA uh, is essentially based on a Docker deployment of uh, MyTARDIS, which we developed at UWA, plus some extensions, uh, user interface additions, post ingest filter, hierarchical file view, and particular configuration uh, requirements for compliance with the Trusted Data Repositories project. Uh, the, so one of the things we did was to map the notion of an experiment in MyTARDIS to mean an experiment maps to a project. And uh, underneath, uh, uh, or to the right there, you can see the rationale for going with MyTARDIS, easy instrument integration, simple data sharing, and so on. Our UWA Docker deployment uh, features of it are that it's easy to deploy or redeploy the uh, MyTARDIS platform. In fact, we were able to deploy on behalf of the University of New South Wales. Uh, there's reduced administrative overheads, for example, updating to new versions. And because the component parts of MyTARDIS are containerized, we've got the properties of self-healing, so a container can be monitored. If it crashes, we can restart it. We can auto-scale, uh, add more containers uh, with demand and we can orchestrate containers using uh, Kubernetes. Finally, onto the link to uh, the Characterization Data Enhanced Virtual Laboratory Project. Uh, so we're one of the partners in this project, which is, of course, Monash-led, uh, and we just heard from Lance. Uh, to the right-hand side there, the diagram shows the project has uh, a number of sub-projects, so three horizontals and uh, four verticals. So UWA has been involved in the infrastructure horizontal and the electron microscopy workbench vertical. So our involvement has specifically been to assist Monash with the deployment of CDL at UWA on pausing infrastructure, uh, to integrate our repository service, TrueData at UWA, which is based on MyTARDIS, uh, with CDL at UWA, so to enable push to functionality. And finally, to contribute software to a new electron microscopy workbench alongside our colleagues from the CMM at UQ, uh, Microscopy Australia and Monash. And the bottom right hand side, uh, just to refresh uh, what Lance had said before, there's a snapshot of the CVL, uh, the CVL instance running in Struden Web. Uh, the list of uh, the applications menu essentially shows the individual workbenches. And I've highlighted one there called a cytometry workbench, and you can see all of the tools inside of that. So what we're adding to this is another one for electron microscopy, non-cryo EM electron microscopy. Challenges uh, with the EM workbench have been, firstly, we had to undertake a survey of EM software tools uh, across microscopy Australia nodes. We discovered that many of the applications are Windows applications, and the CVL is inherently a Linux platform. Uh, so what we've had to do here is to leverage uh, what we've done with the Cytology work previous project and make use of the uh, Wine compatibility layer to uh, deploy applications such as Gatan's digital micrograph. Perhaps for the future we could look at a Windows virtual machine solution within the CDL. Another aspect is uh, dealing with licensed software. So for instance, digital micrograph, uh, there's a a free version and licensed version. So to deploy the licensed version, we need to have discussions with the vendor, Japan. Uh, Standardising containerization across the federation uh, to ensure that uh, we can each add containers to the workbench in the same way so that we have a common recipe. We've had some challenges in dealing with uh, desktops that are CPU only and desktops uh, with GPU capability to try to make containers work in both those uh, environments. And finally, maintenance and support. You really need a community uh, to support the workbench. So in the case of Microscopy Australia with the nodes around the country and interest uh, uh, from, from uh, the electron microscopy uh, group leaders, uh, we have that input and we've got some champions uh, and that's essential to keep the uh, workbench alive and software being contributed to it. So finally, summary and uh, conclusion. The Sea Devil itself leverages outputs from several ARDC projects, including the Nick's Trusted Data Repositories project. Uh, the software from that project is available on GitHub. You can read more about the project on the National Imaging Facility website on the second link. 
The CNC ecosystem now consists of CVL at UWA in beta, CVL at Massive, which we make use of, and our repository service, TrueDat at UWA. And I'll finish with uh, a note on some federation challenges. The first is consistency of look and feel. That's essentially, uh, that's essentially if we want users to adopt the system uh, and to, for each node essentially of the federation to offer the same look and feel of desktop. Integration of data repositories is important. So uh, if I'm at UWA, I should be able to push data from uh, the Pawsey repository to Massive, for instance, uh, to CBL at Massive. Computer, community support and champions for workbenches is essential. Ensuring availability that a user, uh, when a user wants to access the CBL, to have a desktop to work with, that it's uh, there, that we have enough hardware infrastructure to make that happen and that we can share that load amongst the Federation. And finally, the last one, the, the toughest, I think, uh, for, for us all, is how do we support this infrastructure to the future? So at UWA, for instance, that would mean a commitment uh, from central IT to support the cloud services, uh, TrueDat at UWA and CBL at UWA. And with that, I say thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. It's Jerry Ryder here from the ARDC. We've had a really uh, diverse group of presentations uh, today and I thank all our presenters. I know we already have a couple of people that have um, um, questions or comments that they'd like to add. Uh, Leslie Wyborn, I think you had some um, thoughts around the um, characterization uh, project. Do you want to share those? Yeah, how can we plagiarise? I mean, sorry, reuse what you've developed. <laughs> um, at a smaller scale, we I'm speaking from Oscope and I work um, as sort of their uh, helper on, on data, on their data project. And we're going to try and set up a geochemistry network. Now we have a plethora of much smaller scale instruments at various laboratories in various departments and bringing them together is the first issue. But once we do that, you've got pretty well got the back end infrastructure and a lot of the problems that um, I can see we're going to have to do. So yeah, how can we reuse what you've done? I mean, Please? the simplest thing to do is what you've done is reach out to me by email. <laughs> I've already um, done that. We're, we're really happy to partner with people. Um, most of the things that we've developed are completely open source and, and public. Um, there's a few things where we have a little bit of crossover with some of our internal things where, where we typically have a conversation about how we help you get to the point where you can run. And my next question is a social one, because um, we're also working with an international group that are trying to bring geochemists together into an international network. And um, talk about tough nuts to crack. Um, socially, they only want to share that bit that they publish, okay? They want to keep their processing as their priority. This is not Australian, this is international. Well, there's probably a bit goes on in Australia as well. It's that social issue of how you get people to sign on to what is a fairly open system from what I can see. Although I can see, you know, people are, uh, what can I say, um, dialing in and you've got your authorization and that worked out. But generally those processing programs, some people aren't willing to share those. Do you have that problem or you've got a much more open community? No, no, we must definitely have that problem as well. And I feel we can share info on that. <laughs> it's a real spectrum. I mean, some people are really, really keen to to share everything and other people won't, don't want to share anything. So, I mean, we just work through where people are at in that journey. Okay, no, that's good that you've had that issue as well. Okay. Maybe um, share some ideas and war stories. Yeah, war stories is right. <laughs> Just get the knife out of the back of me. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Thanks. At Lance, I think you had a question for the marine folks. I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but do you want to pose that? Yeah, I suppose one of the things that we've struggled with in that um, people don't like it when we do it is the when we've hooked up people's repositories to compute, they freak out once they realise how hard uh, compute can drive their repositories. I was wondering if you've had that experience yet or um, if you've got plans for how you're going to cope with it. Yeah. 
sorry, I was just muted. I think that's there. Ari. Um, yeah, I, my, I was muted. I started talking, but you can hear me. <laughs> um, it definitely is a, a, a concern. So the um, the way that that it's kind of set up is um, we can be running compute with with the way that the libraries are set up. Everything is sort of communicating by HTTP, and the APIs are um, all sort of RESTful HTTP APIs and um, we've had instances where we've run compute on di distributed systems um, where the compute could be on a on, on um, you know my local machine but it could be pulling data down from AWS and we don't need to really um, be pulling the data down as quickly because the the operations for doing image analysis you're spending a lot more time on a single image so it's not really taxing the um, the repository as much as it's taxing the CPU or the GPU that's you're doing the compute on. So you need a you need a high performance machine to be running these uh, deep learning algorithms on, but you don't re or doing the training, but you don't necessarily need high throughput on your I/O ba bandwidth. So so we're kind of um, and we've set up some caching as well um, to try and alleviate that. So um, if you're running a compute node to do some uh, um, prediction on imagery um, if you ever need you know we've set up some caching in the libraries to sort of try to deal with that to limit the amount of throughput from the repository but we haven't really experienced a problem where it's taxing the repository as much as it is uh, an expense for running the compute on the cloud Okay, so thank you, uh, Ari, and good question, Lance. We don't have any more questions in the question uh, pod, uh, and we are just about up for time. Julia, did you want to um, wrap up? Sure. I just, again, wanted to thank everybody for your time. Um, it sounds like there could be opportunity for further technical discussion, um, and we might see whether or not we could break a, a another conversation um, separately. Um, but once again, thank you very much. And please, if you do have any questions for the presenters, let us know and we'll pass them on.